welcome to me talking to the camera about the new feature of React Suspense. This has been a brand new feature in the React community and I felt it needed a further in-depth analysis and thinking about what it means for you as a React application developer. So I have been spending the past week glued to my Twitter stream because that's where it seems most engineering discussions happen nowadays outside of your actual company and trying to piece together exactly what React Suspense means for us as React engineers. The first thing that I want to say is that by all accounts, React Suspense is not out yet. If you actually use the latest stable version of React 16.2, React Suspense is not there. So if you upgrade to the latest stable version, you are safe. The second thing that I want to say is that it seems from what I can piece together that React Suspense will be an opt-in feature. That by default, when you upgrade to a version of React with React Suspense, by default, it will still behave in a synchronous manner. So worries aside, there's nothing to worry about. When you actually do opt in to React Suspense, and again, this is going to be a opt-in feature, then you can start thinking about how you can actually use this feature to make better applications. Now, what's interesting and why I think this has gotten a little bit more confusing is that the React team is actually introducing a whole bunch of new things at once and all they kind of build on top of each other. The React team has actually created a new package to help support the suspending mechanism. This new package is called uh, Simple Cache Provider. And this is a spec implementation of how you would actually implement a global way of handling async rendering in your application, such if you had individual centralized location where you had data that you want to store asynchronously, you could use this simple cache container. And in the example that Dan Ebramov showed in his talk, he's actually reading from this simple cache provider. And when you actually read from the cache provider, you're saying, hey, do you have this async data? And if the, if the async cache provider says, no, I don't have it, what it'll actually do inside that cache provider is it'll actually throw a promise. And that's where there's been some consternation, if you will, about how the React team is implementing this behavior. So when you actually read from the cache, the cache says, I don't have this data, I need to actually go out into the network and get it. And the way that it tells React that there is some async behavior happening is it takes that promise, that async request that it's trying to make, and it'll actually take that promise, create it, and then throw it up. It'll just throw it up to any parent that needs to be aware of it. And it's using a similar mechanism to the error boundaries functionality of React. It's sharing the same underlying code structure, but not implementing the error boundary functionality itself. So let's go back to, you have this async promise that you have, you're throwing it. The React framework is catching that and says, hey, this component that threw this promise has to be suspended. I don't have, I don't have all the information needed yet to render this component, so let me just wait until that promise resolves. So, it marks this component as being needed a suspension, and React goes about its very, very, very merry way, going through all other components that needs to be updated in this render function. Once that promise resolves, React sees that it resolves, says, hey, this promise has resolved, I can actually go back to where that promise was thrown, and then re-render, or for the first time, render that React component, and it gets pushed into the screen. And this kind of repeats itself, so that the next time you go to that component, it says, hey, Cache, do you have this data? The Cache says, yes, I do, and then it will just render itself synchronously. Now, what's interesting about this is the types of UX that it opens up. If you have an iPhone or Android phone, you might have seen this pattern where you'll have a list of items, and when you tap on something, there's a bit of a pause before you actually see the next screen. And I've seen React Core members tweet about this before, wondering about how this behavior works and how it actually impacts people's uh, uh, reflections on how the user interacts with the application. And by using React Suspend, you actually are now able to make this behavior built into React applications. And that's pretty, pretty damn cool, such that you can have that list of movie items that Dan had in his talk, tap on one, all of a sudden all these data gets fetched, and what actually happens is this new component that's being rendered is being suspended before all that data is being resolved. And React knows to not actually flush that new state to the browser before all that async data resolves. So you have this rendering icon that you can actually continuous update that state if you want to. I asked Dan directly and he replied to me, which was quite exciting for me, a little uh, glee for me, and have a spinning icon there before the data resolves and then it renders the entire next screen with all the data already there. But ultimately, as I delve into this more and I think about it and try to understand what the React team is thinking, what I think is ultimately the most exciting thing about this, and also in, in some ways for JavaScript as a whole, not just React, and in some ways also the most controversial part of the talk, and I think this is what Dan was bracing himself for, but uh, I think he's a little so far ahead that 
people were so far behind him that they had no idea to even be outraged yet, is that by implementing this ability to suspend rendering via throwing a promise, the React team has actually created a way of making a indirect way of an async behavior. I was actually Googling about what an algebraic effect is because I've seen uh, Sebastian on the React team talk about this before as well. What is an algebraic effect? And effectively it's a way that you can express async, sync, whatever side effect that you wanna have in a way that you don't have to worry about in your function itself. So if you have a pure function, you can say there's a there is an effect that it has and the function itself doesn't have to worry about it at all. You can actually still write as you would normally and not really worry about any weird idiosyncrasies. And again, that's what I find to be most exciting is that you can still write your React components in a purely declarative and also sync style now. That's what's crazy to me. React has always made it easy to write your applications in a declarative style where you say, this is what I want my UI to look like. And if you had some async behavior that you had to worry about that was on you, the application developer, to consider and actually had a special handling for that yourself. And that's what this new suspend feature is trying to address. It's trying to allow you to actually write asynchronous React components synchronously. And that, for me, is just purely mind-blowing. The ability to actually not worry about how data gets there, just that you want that data. And you let React, the framework, actually worry about all that complexity. So you actually say, you know, my simple cache.read, and either that's going to be a synchronous read or it's going to be an asynchronous read. And because you, as the React application developer, don't have to actually worry about all those things that have been extracted from you. You can just expect things to work as you would normally. And that's, I think, the most powerful thing. You actually get a lot of these new, powerful U ways of expressing your application's UX without actually having to sacrifice any developer ergonomics. That's always been a very big temple feature of the React itself, being very developer friendly. DX has been one of my favorite expressions of the past couple of years. Being able to have that still be imbued in React itself is what I think is so exciting. The most frustrating thing that I think for me about React Suspense is just how new and unexplored it is. And that's both in the community, but also in the React core team itself as well. I've been trying to figure out why the mystery behind and the hype behind why they haven't talked to people about React Suspense before announcing it. And one person uh, gave a very good response that the React team itself didn't really know what they were doing. And I think that's a good piece of being intellectually honest with yourself that the React team is also exploring these areas themselves. And it's a little bit scary to explore unproven ideas before you can actually say that they actually have valid things behind them. So I definitely uh, hold uh, begrudge React team at nothing at all because this is a very wild thing they're trying to do, but if they actually are able to uh, succeed in it, and it looks like they're going to be, uh, it's going to make React applications all the more better for it. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more in-depth understanding about what React Suspense is, why you might be excited about it in the future, but you don't have to worry about it today at all. It should hopefully not change how you write React applications at all. It should actually open up new doors, new avenues of ways of expressing your applications, but not actually have to make you worry about what's going on internally. And at the end of the day, our applications as React applications will be better for them. Hopefully that gives you a little bit more of a 401 about what's going on. Uh, I've been trying to wrap my head around this, so uh, if anything is wrong in here, I do apologize. I hope to add any corrections in it. Please do add some comments down below if you are uh, a little confused about things. I can hopefully explain about them a little bit more in depth as well. And if you are not already a subscriber to my channel, please do subscribe down below where I have more of these in-depth conversations about JavaScript, React, uh, the web, anything that is interesting to me as a netizen on the internet as well. So thank you for listening, and I hope to hear from you again next time. Bye-bye. Also, it's ridiculous that I recorded this video on Sunday, and by today, Wednesday, there is a new controversy that's storming the JS community about this whole thing where we can't use array.flatten because of Moo tools. We have to use Smoosh instead. I mean, I like things moving fast, but sometimes I like to sleep as well. In any case, hope you enjoyed this episode. I'll see you again next time.